this um, event. We've got um, an absolute set of stars. We're going to have a chat with um, uh, Jazz, Nijar, Dalia, Gabriel, Adam Elliott Cooper, and Sahima Manzo Khan um, this evening. This evening's it's like ostensibly is a book launch for the Empire at Home, but um, the way that we wanted to run this was more like um, to ask people to kind of respond to some of the stuff that maybe they found interesting and, and like connected with the research that they do, um, rather than necessarily like just responding to the book. And then we're going to have a, a, a kind of conversation afterwards, and we'll have time, like loads of time for chatting and um, questions. Um, so I think the way we're going to do that is to ask you to put questions in the chat, and then we'll pick those up um, towards the end. Um, I should say, first of all, this event is hosted by um, Pluto, so thanks to them. And they've given us um, like a discount code, um, which Jack is going to put in the chat. Thank you. Um, for 30% off if you get it from them. And also Autonomy. Um, so Autonomy are a think tank, if you don't know them, who are concerned with the uh, future of work and economic planning. And I've been involved with them um, since around about 2018. Um, if you don't know who they are, then please do have a look at their website. Um, and I'd just like to thank as well, so particularly Will for helping set this up and also Jack, who's kind of running the Zoom admin stuff. Um, and also we had this like really lovely holding slide that um, Ether's designed and we weren't able to put it up, but thanks for doing it anyway. <laughs> so let me, let me first of all, just introduce the speakers um, and then kind of tell you how we're gonna, how we're gonna do things. So we've got um, Jasbinder Nijar, who's currently finishing his thesis on the relationship between institutional racism and the militarization of policing in London. He's on the Council Man of Management at the Institute of Race Relations and also the advisory board of the monitoring group. We've also got Dahlia Gabriel, who's writing their PhD on race and gender in the platform economy. Um, they're co-editor of Decolonizing the University and also co-author of Empire's Endgame, Racism and the British State. And they're also a research affiliate with Autonomy. Um, and we've got Adam Elliott Cooper, who's author of forthcoming Black Resistance to British Policing. I can't wait for that. And co-author of Empire's Endgame, uh, Racism in the British State as well. And Sahema Manzor Khan, who is an educator, poet and writer and co-author of A Fly Girl's Guide to the University and author of um, the brilliant post-colonial banter. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to try and keep this relatively informal, like I say, um, and part of, I think, if, if, if any of you have already had a look at the book, you will notice that part of what that, part of what I'm trying to do is like draw things together, kind of pull threads together a lot and really try and um, kind of articulate um, something to consider internal colonialism as this enduring process. And in a similar way, we want, we want to kind of do that. Um, in the way that we put this event together. So I'm going to intro the book a little bit, um, fairly briefly, and then I'm going to ask the speakers to chat about some of their work that relates to the book a little. Um, so maybe something that was prompted by um, something they were thinking about whilst they were reading, or just how something kind of, um, how some of their work relates to it. Um, so we'll do that, and then afterwards we'll have have conversation um, and chance to ask some questions and stuff like that. Okay, so I'll, I'll launch, I'll just to say also we are, we're recording this um, and hopefully we'll, we'll put this up on, on the YouTube, the Autonomy is YouTube um, afterwards. Okay, so I'm gonna kick off. So in the book, um, I argue that as a combination of neo-imperialism and internal colonialism, the continuation of empire has been a fundamental condition of British life as politics and economics. That Britain is forged through the redeployment of structures that facilitated and legitimized slavery, exploitation and extermination. So the nation is this supposedly natural container which is in some way coextant with the British Isles. I suggest that that is a fabrication we're subsidized by near imperial extraction of resources and value from peripheral nations. And we're reliant on bordering, not to exclude migrants whose labor that we need, but to make them precarious, to bar from politics, from infrastructures and welfare. 
So people from the world's periphery and migrants from Britain's prior colonies, we depend upon them inherently, but we form the nation as this kind of supposedly necessary protection against them in order to continue a relationship of coloniality. And that sets up this tension of continuing accumulation and, and dispossession of bodies and lives and communities and lands and natures, but also the protection from that and from them. And I think that we can explain a lot of um, internal colonialism, so policing and bordering, things like financial extortion and post poverty as attempts to manage that tension. Um, so what, like in part, what I'm thinking about is a set of relationships in which Britain's norms and economies and institutions are made as the continuation of a combination of white possession and its protection in order to accumulate wealth, but also to maintain this kind of logical and political integrity. From the start, whiteness, possession and policing were intertwined. Britain was developing its supposedly universal values of fairness, equality and justice at the same time as it was writing the Barbados slave codes and hereditary criminality written into the Criminal Tribes Act in colonial India. The slave codes legislated separate laws for black slaves and white indentured servants, with the former seen as incapable of being brought under British law. They made clear that colonial possession relied on violent theft of labor and lives as a regime of terror. They scaffolded a system where all white people were conscripted to uphold authority of white possession over black people whether they own slaves or not. So from a context in which white indentured servants, particularly the Irish, often worked alongside black African slaves, the collective subjection of slaves was the process through which whiteness could be congealed. White servants were deputized, to use Frank Wilderson's um, term, to capture runaway slaves and to work as part of an emerging police force. Patrols were set up to enforce the slave codes through surveillance and coercion to enter plantations and search quarters, and also to inflict punishment on suspected runaway slaves and those found without passes. Contemporary stop and search practices has its roots in those past checks. Slaves were required to show that they had passes from their masters to be off plantation. So they were used as a way of controlling the movement of slaves. And that control of movement became commonplace across Britain's later colonies. Resistance to slavery as well as colonization more generally was thought of as a kind of regressive threat. As Saeed Jir Hartman writes, the agency of the slave assumed the form of criminality whilst the integrity of whiteness was secured by the abjection of others. There is continuity with the control of slave populations found in who contemporary policing targets, how policing aims at population control, at managing poverty and managing a hyper exploited labor force. These configurations and practices are with us still. They're redacted and denied and banished to history in the same moment that they are entrenched and consolidated in the modern state. We can see that through the continued pervasive policing strategies, but also through proscription of the accumulation of wealth and the marking of communities as out of place or inherently suspicious. In our cities, areas that were produced as waste through racial cheapening have been renewed for the return of the wealthy. The separation of high wage tech information and management work from a low wage service sector has, the, has had the effect of tightly coupling both together. And as the lockdown is confirmed, the wealthy are reliant on those service workers, cleaners, childminders, delivery riders, but who are forced to live elsewhere. The policing forms a necessary component in this continuation of this uh, hyper exploitation of migrant and racially cheapened labor, together with the dispossession for resource and wealth extraction, um, including things like dispossession through managed decline. Um, of racialized communities, geographies, and infrastructures. And this gets to a central argument that I'm making in the book that much of Britain's internal colonialism is a kind of management strategy for our proximity with those 
that have been made as perpetual outsiders, those people upon whom we both absolutely depend, but also supposedly require protection from to maintain that relationship of dependency. And this is developing Fanon's analysis of the colony as it makes its way beyond tightly segregated spatial zones and across more pervasive and insidious modes of control in which policing and ubiquitous bordering have converged. In the past few years, with um, I think particularly things like uh, the Brexit vote um, and the kind of rise of the right and this, this, this kind of narrative that we've seen. We've also seen many well-meaning people lamenting how Britain has got worse. They say that we're losing our liberal British values and our compassion and so on. And this is, this is often in, the, in response to this seeming acceptability now of white nativist statements like, why can't you just be grateful? And if it's so bad here, you should go home. They're supposed to oppose those more exclusionary nationalisms, but this position is based on a kind of moral liberalism that we should be hospitable to those within need, within reason, and we should be more inclusive. I'm arguing that these are two sides of the same coin, that both inclusive and exclusionary politics have served as support to the British nation as imperial and colonial system. And as we know, large swathes of the political left have called for stronger borders as defense against global capital flows and migration, where both have been understood as the kind of violence that's done to our wealth and our communities and our working conditions. The underlying idea being that the movement of people into the national economy and culture is a threat to our future progress. These positions produce the nation as a horizon for political imagination. And that relies on obscuring the neo-imperial relations of dependency that we have on peripheral nations. It naturalizes our right to Britain's wealth and living standards, which continues to rely on those relations. And it consolidates the idea of an other who is making claims on our land, and our money and our culture. Britain as a nation is a global imperial system that continues to claim rights over the accelerated extraction of resources, value, it offsets carbon, it treats people as disposable. Like I say, not by ending movement, but by making movement more surveyed, more precarious, more expensive, and more temporary. The trajectory of this modern remaking of the world is one in which all life is shaped, transformed, constricted rather than necessarily dominated. It's a state in which the extinction of others is the condition of our survival. It's a state in which there's dust where there was water, where there's people locked in camps, there's paramilitary incursions on migrants and on council estates, with workers dying in factory fires and big oil executives meeting just miles from a devastating cyclone to hash out how best to extract and sell off Mozambique's natural gas as green energy. This is the world that we're increasingly conscripted into policing while state politics collapses across right and left towards ethno-nationalism and intensifying borders under pressures of migrant flows that are exacerbated by economic and climate collapses. But there is a gap between this attempted subordination and its resistance and refusal that those in power cannot even see. Abolition movements, movements against state violence, migrant detention and bordering, these work in continuity with those who won't rest until the world has changed. There are spaces where the end of Britain is already practiced. They provide us space to consider questions about how life is valued how we think about property and how we think about kinship far beyond the national container. Not just to abolish the wealthy, but to abolish wealth. Not just to abolish police, but to abolish policing in all its forms. There are traces of an end of Britain that is also a beginning. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask um, Jazz to come in now. Thanks, Jazz. Okay. Um, okay. So let me um, let me begin by uh, thanking you all for being here this evening, um, and also thanking James for inviting me to speak at the launch of his new book, The Empire at Home. I also want to congratulate James on writing the book, which is a critical intervention in developing our understanding of contemporary policing and its relationship with colonial history, warfare, law, nation, borders, capital, and other political and economic factors that determine racialized violence, hyper-exploitation, exclusion, and death. There are many aspects of the book that I could elaborate on, but given time restraints, I want to discuss two overarching themes that I think are both that I think are powerful, both in a theoretical and political sense, and that I hope will lay some of the groundwork for our collective discussion later on. So the, so the first of these themes is the relationship between colonial and contemporary forms of racism and how Britain's destructive past abroad continues, continues locally in the present, albeit in mutated and developed fashion. For example, early in the book, James states that Britain was rebuilt as the continuation of colonialism, and that the history of post-war Britain is also the history of colonial strategies and techniques deployed at home. The book then shows us how practices like segregation, criminalization, hyper-exploitation, preemptive policing and securitization traveled from colonial spaces like South Asia, the Caribbean and Africa to urban Britain. In doing so, the book argues that colonialism is an enduring process within Britain itself. So this endeavor to connect past and present forms of racism is important for many reasons. So firstly, and perhaps most obviously, it shows us that race still matters as a political, social, and economic force. The neoliberal doctrine of no excuse suggests that racism as a structural problem is virtually non-existent and that work ethic, application, and drive are all ingredients for personal advancement. We're told by our conservative government to stop the sense of so-called victimization and to celebrate Britain's success stories. But the empire at home guards against political flippancy by reminding us of the embedded nature of racism, given its status as a long-standing and continuing strategy for shaping socio-economic order. As such, the book encourages us to grapple with racism's reproductive, eruptive, and enduring character. And for me, when reading the book, I was led to think about how the evolution of racism across time and space goes hand in hand with the, with the development of capitalism, now in its neoliberal phase. And what this all does is point to what I hope we can all agree upon, which is that dismantling the structures of discrimination and exploitation are corresponding endeavors that require reckoning as much with the past as with the present, and as much with global politics as with local arrangements. The second point I wanna make about James's book is that it offers us a basis for recognizing various forms of contemporary racism as relational, both in a historical and political sense. In other words, the book shows us how the anti-black, anti-Muslim and anti-migrant racisms of today relate to each other through their roots in colonial history, through, through their remaking of internal colonies within Britain and through their role in, in legitimizing things like securitization, weaponized and non-weaponized violence and other modes of militarization. For instance, the book, the book supplements something I've shown in my own work, which is that today's heavy handed policing of black youth under the war on gangs can be traced back to the excessive regulation of colonized communities in India and Kenya, who were imagined as threatening lawlessness, disorder and social breakdown. Furthermore, the book discusses how counterterrorism policing adopts strategies of counterinsurgency and produces multicultural communities as, in James's own words, latent enemy insurgents. 
By placing these two contexts side by side, we can see how the racisms of today share common ground regarding colonial history, police warfare, and their, and their attendant forms of denial, degrega degradation, and death. And as, much as that, I, I, and as much as that analysis is theoretically powerful, I think it serves a potent political function too, especially in today's neoliberal conditions of isolation, fragmentation, and atomization. To be precise, the book speaks to broader debates about how efforts to resist hyper-intrusive and violent policing and to, and to defund and ultimately abolish the police must not be discreet. Rather, they must be part of an actively unified anti-racist fight back a fight back against what James describes as Britain that could only be built on exploitation and elimination and whose survival is dependent on the extinction of others. So as a way of concluding, I want to again congratulate James on writing this thought provoking book that connects us to a shared history of struggle and therefore connects us to each other. I think and hope it will be an important resource for our teaching, our wider community engagement and our collective struggles and ongoing efforts to reimagine a different and better world. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Shaz. That was lovely. Um, okay, I'm going to ask Dahlia. Hello. Um, hi, everyone. It's really nice um, to be able to see everyone. Normally on these events, I feel like I is very kind of I'm just looking at a screen of myself talking which is really disconcerting so it's quite nice to see everyone um so um I really really um enjoyed this book and I want to share Jazz's uh congratulations of James because I think that and you know in in what I've prepared today to speak about there's going to be a lot if any of you were at the book launch for Empire's Endgame there'll be a lot of crossover um because there is you know, I think that, that but there is a lot of echoes between the two books and um, they do, the books do do it in different ways and with different focuses, so you should definitely buy both. Um, but it tells me that um, a lot of us are thinking about these questions um, and have been compelled to think about these questions, um, how Britain operates as a colonial space um, and kind of the spatial politics of, of imperialism and how it, exists in the present. Um, and so the fact that there are these, you know, I've, we've been, not only do we have these books out, but these conversations keep coming up and it tells me that the moment um, really calls for it. So I think that that's really interesting. And I think that, so the, the, the whole book is really good. The chapter that I really found really useful and that I'm probably going to focus a lot on today, because I also think it echoes my work mostly is chapter five, it's called, extinction politics um, and that chapter I really like the way that it kind of writes what a lot of us have been thinking about the lessons that we've had to learn over the past uh, sort of five years um, obviously the lessons go back much further than that but a lot of these conversations have been animated by what's happened over the past five years um, with the rise of uh, a seeming possibility of parliamentary socialism um, which kind of brought together a lot of disparate groups um, on the left to try and figure out what it would actually mean to, to possibly take state power. And I think that the book really teases out um, the naivety of the British left when it comes to understanding what the state is, what it does um, in this moment, what its character is. And that in part comes from its the refusal of lots of parts of the mainstream left um, to draw from the theoretical interventions that arise from anti-racist struggle. Um, the lens of race, the lens of colonialism can help really bring into focus the myriads of official and unofficial tools and techniques of the state um, as something that secures the accumulation of capital. That is not a neutral tool that you can just get voted into and then you suddenly have you know the power and the ability to redesign a new a new way of doing things and I also think it cuts through some of the nostalgia um, that we have frequently had to resort to um, within movements nostalgia um, for the idea of public goods that never were entirely public 
uh, and Gaminda Bambra writes brilliantly on this um, about, you know, the, the reliance of the welfare state on colonial expansion, on, on not just colonial expansion, but also uh, harmful migrant labor practices um, and migrant labor practices that, as James mentioned, use border controls um, to manage and create precarity um, amongst a particular workforce. And, you know, he, um, the, the drawing, I also really liked the, the drawing that James does on uh, assumptions and kind of the internalization by a lot of, and you call it the progressive patriotic left, um, which we also actually talk about in the other book as well, um, that this internalization of the idea that neoliberalism um, is about freedom of the market and absence of state interference, um, that it's all about sort of deregulation. But anyone sort of living in the UK today knows that it is far, and who feels the sharp edge of the state, knows that that's a very simplistic way, um, you know, to, to say that neoliberalism functions through the wholesale retreat of the state. Rather, it's much more about the retreat of some parts of the state, the parts of the state that ostensibly provide care, um, although that care has never been provided for everyone, of course, and the bolstering uh, of other punitive and policing parts of the state. So it's not really deregulation, it's active management through the state's absences and its appearance. And race is very important for the shaping of that character of the state. Um, and you write on page 122, you write, the virulent protection of Britain's property regimes required not just the expropriation of global resources, but also their fortification from possible incursion through the normalization and sanctification of, quote, the national exclusion of economic migrants and other non-nationals who they designate as political strangers. And I think that one thing that I found particularly spoke to a lot of the things I've been thinking about uh, is this idea of, as, as you know, conversations around Britain's history has become have become more present in the mainstream and more more uh, common. There is this tendency to rely on this idea that we are simply dealing with historical legacies, and this is simply a matter of um, how do we engage with Britain's historical reality in a way that doesn't offend people. Um, obviously, that is not the point, and I think this book does a really good way, does a really good job of showing how we are not just talking about legacies, but we're talking about live realities. And one way in which one manifestation of this live reality is the way in which a particular story around freedom of movement, a particular story around globalization, has emerged that has laid the groundwork for a nativist right and has also boxed, in, boxed the left into a corner um, and allowed certain parts of the left that have historically uh, been invested in the designation of the deserving and the undeserving poor, um, to use Robbie Shilliam's uh, to use Robbie Shilliam's formulation, have allowed them to become particularly bolstered. And I mentioned in the previous event um, on Empire's Endgame that powerlism has actually really become the hegemonic story of what Britain is, um, of how people make sense of Britain's spatial and political and cultural uh, existence. Um, and, you know, I sort of read this quote out in the previous, in the, in the Empire's Endgame event, but I'm going to read it out again because I think it's really useful. Um, this, speech, this quote from the Rivers of Blood speech um, opens with, the Commonwealth immigrant came to Britain as a full citizen, to a country which knew no discrimination between one citizen and another, and he entered instantly into the possession of the rights of every citizen, from the vote to free treatment under the NHS. But while to the immigrant entry to this country was admission to privileges and opportunities eagerly sought, the impact upon the existing population was very different. For reasons which they could not comprehend and in pursuance of a decision by default on which they were never consulted, they found their, themselves made strangers in their own country. They, fain, they found their wives unable to obtain hospital beds in childbirth and their children unable to obtain school places. Their, um, their plans and prospects for the future defeated 
At work, they found that employers hesitated to apply to the immigrant worker the standards of discipline and competence required of the native born worker. They began to hear as time went by more and more voices, which told them that they were now the unwanted. So while memorialized as a kind of fringe extremist aberration in British politics, the central tenets, the central characters form the underlying principles of how we understand immigration and Britain um, today. And that story has three characters. It has the migrant who has sort of lucked out and been able to, or the racialized other who has lucked out and been able to escape their pathological destitution in their home country. Um, the second is the global elite who sort of has this unexplained love of immigrants and just wants to kind of, or is just using them to kind of undercut white workers. And the final is the white citizen, what Powell calls the decent ordinary fellow Englishman. And we see echoes of this in our very own movements. And James draws on this quote by Len McCluskey in 2016, where he says, in the last 10 years, there has been a gigantic experiment at the expense of ordinary workers. Countries with vast historical differences in wage rates and living standards have been brought together in a common labor market. The result has been sustained pressure on living standards, a systematic attempt to hold down wages, and to cut the costs of social provision for working people. So we see not only the pervasive uh, and reanimated life of that phrase, you know, whether it's the ordinary Englishman in Powell's speech or the ordinary worker in McCluskey's speech, we see that character lives on as the protagonist of um, British politics. And I think, you know, when we think about the tools that we have come to that debate with, we've come to that battle with this paternalistic narrative of immigration as good because of these nebulous ideas of cultural diversity, um, because of that seemingly bottomless migrant work ethic. It's a colonial logic of extracting value from black and brown people, allowing them to survive on the condition that they open a nice restaurant or work to the bone cleaning up our city or looking after our relatives. And these sort of sallow liberal ideas of tolerant multiculturalism where racism is a problem simply because it's impolite. And given that, no wonder we're losing. Um, and you know, here and across the Atlantic and throughout Europe, the right is winning because we are leaving intact the logics of bordering and race. And therefore we're leaving intact um, capital, capital's beating heart. And so this kind of um, speaks to some of my work on um, the platform economy, uh, where recently we just saw this amazing win by Uber drivers on who managed to secure access to the category of worker, which now as that category of the full-time formal worker shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, especially accelerated by the 2008 crash, the, the contours around that worker, that category of worker are heavily racialized. And there's a lot of intersection between the contours around and the boundaries around the worker and all of the rights that that, entite, that, that entails and the boundaries of the human being, the boundaries of the citizen, the, the boundaries of the deserving poor. So the question becomes then, you know, what are the avenues out of this? Um, and I think the avenues now, I want to preface that with, we can't just message our way out of this. Um, it's not just a matter of telling a different story, but telling a different story can help guide our action um, and can, can help guide our organizing. And so what we need to see is this shift away from this kind of idea of um, supporting migrant, of being against borders and being against coloniality, not because out of some kind of charitable uh, energy for those who are less fortunate than us, but it's because race and borders in this book outlined so brilliantly that race and borders are man-made tools of class war. They are the primary tools of class war from the first act of globalization which was not the 1970s but was happened with the first european ship that sailed to africa transported human beings around the world as enslaved workers 
and the unprecedented formalization and inst institutionalization of border regimes and taxonomies of race under colonialism was how capitalism became the world system that it is today. And race and borders do not just thwart worker solidarity by just dividing us, it's not mere superstructure. Race and borders are the logics through which some human beings are devalued enough um, to find themselves with no other option other than to do the dirtiest work of capitalism. And the lower you are valued in society, the dirtier the work you do. Um, so in short, we need to come to an understanding that supporting border controls, supporting colonial expansion is a form of scabbing. And it's not just scabbing because migrants comprise a huge segment of the working class in this country and across the global north, but because categorizing some people as more human than others, or some people as more illegal than others, is the central organizing principle of how class is made. And the separation and the hierarchization of workers through gender, race, citizenship is not separate to class war. It is class war. But I would say that, you know, not only does racial oppression and racial violence and dispossession, as outlined in this book, shape our world and shape, you know, the character of the state and the character of capital, but the resistance of racialized groups to that oppression also does. It defines what can be gotten away with. Um, it also teaches us essentially everything that we know about liberation. And it's also incredibly important, and James also closes the chapter with this, because of the impending climate crisis, because the climate crisis prevent, presents new avenues for the very techniques that are outlined in this book to entrench its grasp um, and to animate that violence in the name of the em of emergency, whether that is resource extraction in order to um, create renewable energy, so you know mining in order to make um, renewable cars, whether it's eugenicist population growth, or whether it's the displacement and imposition of ex excessive policing and um, extraction on some communities who are literally characterized as pollution, um, which is something I can go into more in the questions if, if that is something that people want to hear more about. It kind of relates to my work on Uber drivers uh, and stuff. So that is why I think this book is really interest this book is really useful and important for this particular moment because we have found ourselves at this impasse and this book is exceptional in clarifying the conditions that we are currently existing in clarifying the historical route but also making it clear that this is not just about what has happened in the past or how capitalism has come to exist but also about how capitalism and the state continues to exist and that's what's really important I think. Thanks so much, Talia. Um, I'm struggling not just to like launch into conversation immediately. Um, but yeah, it's amazing. Um, thank you. So, uh, Adam, if you're happy to, to go next. Sure. And um, thanks so much, James, for a really uh, provocative and interesting, I think, some ways timely, but also long overdue book, I think, as well. Um, because I guess as I was reading through the book, I wasn't simply thinking about the ways in which I think you really boldly and, and importantly draw upon so many different aspects of uh, state power and racial capitalism, whether it be through policing and borders or the welfare state or through work, through housing, all these different things. But I was also thinking a lot about the the different ways in which campaigns and movements and, and radical organizations have been attempting to develop those links between uh, the, the racism that they see and experience and, um, in, uh, in contemporary Britain and those histories of empire. Because I think it's pati always particularly difficult for us to do that historical work in this country um, in comparison with somewhere like the United States, which is of course, a lot of which is where a lot of the kind of dominant narratives around uh, racism and racialization uh, arise, because there is obviously this far more coherent history in the United States. You have this, you have one kind of landmass, and although of course you have different types of slavery and different types of laws in different states and different parts and different parts of the country, you can tell a relatively coherent story from settler colonialism to chattel slavery to reconstruction um, and segregation and so on. But of course, with empire, it's so much messier. 
so much more slippery with different colonies, some of them slave colonies, some of them settler colonies, some of them indirect rule, some of them direct rule, all of these different types of, of, of colonies and therefore these different types of colonial governance, make, meaning, making it so much more difficult to draw those connections and see those patterns and identify the, 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 way, the ways in which those forms of colonial governance have influenced forms of racial governance um, in, our, in, uh, in modern Britain. But I think you've, I think what you've been able to do is by drawing the, drawing upon those histories isn't just really important for um, academics and researchers and writers, but also so important for the activists trying to make sense of this history of empire and its influence upon um, uh, upon contemporary race. So whether I think about the uh, the campaigns to decolonize the curriculum or to decolonize museums, which arose a few years ago, where to begin with, people started feeling confused about uh, these demands. How can how can Britain decolonize? It's it's the global South that decolonizes. It's not Britain that decolonizes. Um, and so pushing through that those kinds of um, uh, those kinds of retorts and that confusion, I think was I think would have been made a lot easier as if this book was around all those years ago. Um, but obviously also organ um, campaigns like Roads Must Fall, right? Use, um, and identifying these qu quite tangible sy symbols of empire and using that as a conduit to identify the links between our universities and other educational institutions and those links to empire, which are still very material as well as being kind of symbolic and discursive. And of course, perhaps most obviously, um, uh, the protests that we saw in the summer of 2020, where activists went out and sought to make those very tangible links um, between empire and contemporary racism. When news reporters and politicians were saying, oh, isn't that racism in America so terrible? You know, that stuff with George Floyd, it's so, you know, it's so um, reprehensible. I can't believe that happened. It, it, was, it was in that moment that we saw activists identify and attack these uh, symbols of British imperialism in order to, in order to negate um, the attempts to whitewash Britain's colonial history, treat racism as a form of prejudice which has arisen in the post-war period as people from, um, uh, from uh, the Commonwealth, from Africa and Asia and the Caribbean have migrated to Britain in significant numbers. And it's th instead draw attention to the ways in which that history, although uh, is, a, is a history which didn't a lot of the time didn't take place on the British mainland, certainly is fundamentally linked um, to British governance today. But also, it's also extremely timely because it also, I guess, builds upon uh, older um, or uh, literatures which attempt to do this kind of work. Um, obvious things like uh, the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies and the work of people like Stuart Hall and Paul Gilroy and others, but also, of course, the work of the, that has emerged out of um, organisations like the Institute of Race Relations, which in, both in, in, in their own ways have sought to draw upon these legacies, both whether it be discursively and culturally or materially, um, um, uh, through uh, different kind of forms of theorising, but also, of course, um, looking very closely um, at those different histories as well. But I think, for me, I, I was interested, of course, I was really interested um, and excited on the sections on policing um, and prisons, um, which is relates to my own research. But I think I was also really interested in kind of three other areas. Um, one of them, of course, is relation to what the welfare states um, and, you're, and you're thinking around that, which, um, of course, um, speaks to um, uh, some of the work we've been thinking about uh, in the Empire's Endgame book. But also, I think what really um, uh, got me excited was the, was, the, was the analysis you did around housing as well. Um, and so there's, there's a, there's a there's, and, and it's not a, a giant component of the book, but I think it's a really important intervention because I, I, I spent about two or three years working um, on as a, as a postdoc on a research project on, on council housing in London. And for people who might be familiar with the literature on housing in London, um, particularly the literature on gentrification um, in cities like London, but, uh, but other cities in the country um, as well. If someone who had didn't know anything about Britain at all uh, went and read most of the literature on gentrification and critical literature on housing in this country, they would assume that Britain is a monoculture. They would assume that Britain um, is ethnically homogenous, or they would certainly assume that Britain is a country which doesn't really have racism. And so much of the literature 
around gentrification focuses so much on class. I think partly because a lot of the people thinking about it don't have the conceptual tools to, to try to discern how and why it is that, despite the fact that um, a lot of these council estates in cities like London, which are being gentrified, are um, uh, majority people of colour, white people are also being affected by gentrification as well. So therefore, it can't be racism. This is this this to put it crudely. This is the way in which a lot of the kind of conceptualization, um, the the problem. I think a lot of the conceptualizing case, conceptualization comes up against. And so, being able to cut through that and look at the ways in which actually the kinds of forms, these forms of dispossession in relation to housing, aren't something which is necessarily new to Britain and isn't something which has simply arisen through neoliberalism or anything like that, but also draws upon histories of British governance which have taken place outside of the borders of the British mainland and looking at those colonial histories in, in order to inform, better inform our understanding of housing, I think is a crucial contribution um, to uh, the way in which I think other people interested in housing can better understand the kinds of struggles taking place. Because when I, when when we when we got, when we work in communities that are facing um, uh, council estates uh, regeneration and or so-called regeneration, but it's generally demolition and expulsion, um, they're very aware of the racialized dynamics of these forms of state power and state violence. They're very aware of the ways in which um, uh, uh, racism is used to criminalize their communities, to frame their communities as being like hotbeds of, of deviance and danger and violence, but also being places which are dirty, which require cleaning, which require cleansing, which require regeneration. All of these different racialized patterns are, are quite self-evident for the people living there. But it's about, it's about, but I think what the books helps us, but by weaving all of those different kind of uh, facets of state power and capitalism together, by thinking in conjunction, in conversation with questions relating to labour and borders and the welfare state and prisons um, and policing, I think we, I think, I think it can be a really useful way of being able to better understand the wider context in which questions like housing, um, which are too often whitewashed in their analysis, can really um, be more holistically understood in in, the, in their context of of, uh, of racial capitalism, or as, as you talk about in the book, um, internal colonisation. So I think the last thing I, I, I guess I really want to say is that I think this is a book for so many people. Um, I think this is a book that so many people can get even a, even a small amount from because it covers so much ground in really, really interesting ways. And I think for, for, for me, one of the really interesting and, and, and finally really interesting ways is the, is the manner in which the book draws upon not simply those histories of colonialism, but modern imperialism as well. Because very often um, it's 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 considered to be it's even it, a lot a lot of the, the literature and a lot of the thinking seeks to do one thing or the other seeks to draw upon those historical legacies and then look at racism today or connect racism today with wider patterns of contemporary imperialism and it's by doing that kind of spatial and temporal work all all in one all in one place that we can draw together those multiple threads that take us across time and space um, in ways that are really really urgent for uh, tackling the myriad of issues that the book uh, confronts so yeah thanks so much thanks thanks so much adam um yeah <laughs> um so yeah i'm gonna ask uh Suhema to to come in now if that's all right sure thank you uh hi everybody um really lovely to be here with you all and thank you james for um, inviting me to speak um it's been really interesting to hear um all the other speakers as well this evening i feel sort of like yeah i'm excited for the discussion as well um i will also congratulate james on this book <laughs> don't want to embarrass you james but yeah it's uh, you've done a pretty good job um i found it really i found it really exciting um for many of the reasons people have already said but I think at the moment with the research I'm doing, you know, when you, you kind of, I think you kind of project onto a book what you're kind of needing to see in any way. And I think for me, it was that over the last year, I think there's been at the same time as um, what you were saying, Adam, about kind of the analysis of uh, racism during the summer was that it's, you know, it's not here, it doesn't kind of exist in the same way as America. But I think also this fragmentation, right, where we see this idea that I think particularly with conversations around Islamophobia, it's always that it's this, you know, this other thing that we still are trying to define and like we need to have all these inquiries and, you know, APPGs about 
And I think what's useful about James's lens in this is if we can look at colonialism and coloniality as a, as a historical process or set of processes, I think it becomes much easier to discern that, you know, Islamophobia is nothing special or unique necessarily, but that in fact, if we have that historical view, it's just a manifestation and operation of white supremacist capitalism. And seeing it like that, I think really helps us to, to navigate it. Um, and I think that's important in a really practical sense, because at the same time as these kind of quite shallow debates, I suppose, about Islamophobia, is it hate crime, you know, oh, what do we do about it? Um, at the same time as that, there's a really concerted effort by the state to um, impose political docility onto Muslims, right? So we see counter extremism. Um, and yesterday, actually, I'll talk about this in a second, but yesterday the, the government released this new report called, <laughs> so they, they're saying they sort of, they've discovered a new form of extremism, believe it or not, uh, called hateful extremism, <laughs> which is just as ambiguous and vague as, as you know, it sounds, um, but which, you know, essentially allows for the government to say that anything that, you know, it dissents or threatens um, its agenda is, is extremism and therefore should be criminalized. And it's just a kind of, propaganda campaign, I suppose, for um, criminalizing anything. Um, but what's interesting is that a lot of counter extremism work that's more secretive um, goes on through uh, a home office department that basically creates these outfits that are supposedly organic, right? And James talks about this in uh, the book as well. And um, I've had a couple of, you know, <laughs> run-ins with some of these, these platforms. And so one that I find really interesting is um, a platform called Super Sisters. Right, it's just literally just an Instagram page that seems that it's for teenage Muslim girls and it's all about, you know, sport and friendship and positive representation and this kind of thing. Um, now, this is home office funded, right? This is a home office project. Uh, they don't even have that many followers. It's like, what's the point? But <laughs> so it's this project that you're kind of wondering, what's the purpose of it? And I think it's very clear that the idea is to create a very apolitical um, Muslim teenagehood. And the reason I think that's important in terms of this book is that we need to make those historical connections because there is such a deliberate effort by the state to make us blind to them, to erase and obscure the ways that racism, policing, imperialism connect. Um, and I particularly like about the book that, you know, James, you have this critique of, of the national horizon, the, the, the nation being the horizon of our politics. Um, because I think that's another thing, right, is that, you know, when we talk about conversations around um prevent uh, particularly you know it's, it's sort of i guess reached a stage where people are happy you know there's a general mood that prevent is bad we should repeal it um but i think in, in that there's there's a mistake that is made that really just limits our critique of policing and, and racialized criminalization to this one piece of legislation right and we don't necessarily make the connections that your book makes if we look at counterinsurgency as a history that actually this is the same logic that underpins any type of criminalization and policing that, that's, you know, arguably the entire criminal justice system in, in, in the UK, um, but also across the world. And I think that's what I found really exciting about this book. So you can talk about, you know, Iraq, you can talk about Kenya, and you can talk about Birmingham all in the same breath, because actually the kinds of policing that we're seeing are the same formula. And at the same time, what I liked about the book is that you weren't making the argument that it's the same, right? That actually it's, it, there is reconfiguration, there is something new happening. And the reason I say that is, you know, I was trying to understand to myself this hateful extremism report yesterday. And I just want to read uh, the definition of hateful extremism, um, which is that it's activity or materials directed at an out group who are perceived as a threat to an in group motivated by or intending to advance a political, religious or racial supremacist ideology. Arguably that is the nation state. Right, the nation state is an in-group that defines an out-group as a threat to it to uphold white supremacy. <laughs> and so when we have this kind of absolute erasure of coloniality, the state can produce a very materials that should by all rights, you know, implicate it, but instead just individualize and you know completely fragment our understandings of, of power. So all we have is this idea that, you know. I think in the report, there's a point where it's sort of like incels, neo-Nazis, Islamists, they're all just, you know, they're all the same type of extremists, right? There's no context, there's no historical, um, yeah, there's no historical structures that kind of build or, or inform anything. So I find this book really 
useful in a practical sense that, you know, if we can keep these conversations um, that seem to be happening more and more, if we can kind of keep that analysis in frame, it acts as a really good antidote to those kind of deliberate attempts to flatten those conversations. And um, another thing I, I, I liked about the book that I found useful was the conversations around space and um, place and I suppose geographies and, and things that um, people have mentioned already, but particularly thinking about how, um, you know, again, today with the research that I'm doing, um, you know, the integration narrative is and has always been very much part and parcel with prevent. So from the early 2000s, you even have a police chief who says that, you know, um, we don't really see the difference between prevent and community cohesion, right? They're the same thing. It's, it's all about criminalizing and regulating communities, um, racialized communities. And so the reason that I find that interesting is that it, when we look at it through this lens that James provides, um, I think there's a point in the book, James, where you talk about um, colonization of Sierra Leone and how um, the, uh, the colonizers sort of built their residences deliberately above and away from indigenous people. And the idea being that, you know, we don't want the contagion of the natives to, you know, I don't know, affect us. Um, and I think, you know, that's really fascinating to think about now today. Um, you know, my family live in Bradford, and obviously that's one place where, his, you know, through the lens of history since 2001 riots to kind of, you know, the all the kind of images associated with Bradford, um, there's this idea still of the contagion of that space, right? The idea that it, it, if people go there, if it's not integrated, you know, terrorism will spread and extremism will, um, you know, get, get into the population. And so, again, it's useful to have that historical lens because we can then make the case, right, that this isn't a simply an argument. Because I think what happens for a lot of um, racialized people, and I see it amongst a lot of Muslims, is that we then fall into the trap of saying, you know, yes, we are integrated. Yes, we are British. Yeah, 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 you know, like this real making the case that we can be citizens too in the, in the good way that you need us to be. And I think it's important to have these types of books to remind us that <laughs> there's no point. That is a useless case to make. Um, and because the underlying premise of it uh, is, is impossible, right? You know, integration is this is a promise that has an impossible condition, right? You know, integrate and you will receive full rights but you will never be able to integrate because, you know, by definition, the state is white supremacist and you can't, you can't enter that uh, as a racialized person. So, uh, yeah, I, I found this book really important. And I guess a final note to say is that I think a lot of conversations last year have been uh, focused around, I mean, not focused around, but we've, we've been seeing more and more conversations around abolition. Um, and I think a big part of those conversations is about how do we imagine what's next, right? Like how you know, what specifically will those processes look like? And I think there can be a lot of angst around that. Um, but I find a lot of reassurance in the fact that, you know, when we have a book like this, when we have histories like these, we can, I, th I, th I think we can kind of frame it to ourselves that if something is so clearly constructed, right, it has a beginning, then it can surely have an end. And that doesn't feel such a utopian and kind of um, idealistic vision because already, as you say, there are many ways in which that world, that criminalizing, racializing, capitalist world isn't, um, isn't sort of inescapable. There are places that we prick holes and that we um, outmaneuver it. And so, yeah, I just find that exciting and I, and I really enjoyed the book. So yeah, thank you, James and congrats and um, everyone should buy the book. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. <laughs> and yeah, thanks all of you um, for those comments. Was, that was, um, yeah, it was great. It was great. I mean, you are like reflecting back stuff that I'm trying to get out in the book, I think probably better than I actually managed to do it. So <laughs> this is heartening to say the least. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, I, just, I, I appreciate that. I think um, one thing that I would like to so I'm not going to like respond to all these comments because that was it's going to take too long anyway. But also I just want us to kind of chat really. But I do want to say um, one thing that I that I really appreciate about what what I think all of you have, have kind of mentioned is um, like Adam was talking about timeliness and and Dahlia can obviously connecting us to um, Empire's Endgame and the the fact that more more people are, are like. Um, starting to think about Britain in terms of this, this, this lens, whether in terms of internal colonialism or, or, or at least in terms of this, like, at least the legacies of, of imperialism and le legacies of empire, and um, and how that that 
yeah, even if they're not using that kind of framework, then they're that still looking at that enduring process. Um, and, and like, I really appreciate that. I think one of the things that as you get into both academia, like either academia or like publishing books, is that everything you do is supposed to be unique and like for the first time ever. Um, and you have to write the proposal and you know, you write your abstract and all this kind of thing. And it's got to be like this unique vision. And I think, and I, obviously I did that, but one of the things that I really hope, and I, I mean, I said this in, in the preface is that I, you know, particularly as I'm writing this um, as, a, as a white man, I think it's incredibly important to, to say how absolutely indebted I am to all of the activist movements that um, Adam is talking about also to primarily black and Asian writers who, who have done huge, huge amounts of work I'm trying to draw on. Um, and, and in my own role to kind of hopefully speak to, um, to whiteness, I guess, and to, and to think about how that, like white possession, the logics of white supremacy have attempted to um, install a kind of colonial regime inside the British state. Um, and, and, all, and like in the preface, I think I said something like this, the story is, is not new to, to many people. It's new to some people and some people are kind of realizing this and waking up and understanding this, um, but it's certainly not new to many. Um, but it's an, it's an important point to make and, I, and I'm really glad to see that there's like other books coming out um, that are making similar points. And also like Kahindi Andrews book, I haven't read that, but that looks like it's making a similar kind of um, intervention. Um, which is which is great. So, okay, let, let me let me um, let me try and like, I guess like let's let's just let's just start chatting about this. I think there's too many things to kind of choose from, but I think one thing that I'd like to to, to pick up on, um, let's relate it to the you know this question in the chat right, which relates to stuff that I think all of you have been talking about, which is essentially like how we how we understand the relationship between racism and capitalism, um, how we understand um, the, this problems around like cohesiveness on the left and the, the idea of like I've, in the book, like um, you've mentioned, talk about how the left labors on the horizon of the nation of, as this kind of political imagination, right? And it naturalizes, um, it naturalizes several things in the process. And, and I think I call this like embedded imperialism or something, which is kind of implicit in, in the political gestures that are often made. Um, and just to say to everybody, um, here, yeah, if you wanna put some questions in the chat, we'll try and pick up on them. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of draw this together with this question from um, Habiba, um, which is really one of like how, you know, how do we create alliances with um, the, you know, th those who are exploited under, un under labor? Um, so the traditional kind of working classes, but also I guess the, you know, the precariousness um, relates to what uh, Dali was talking about. I like this idea a lot about um, scabbing. So like the support for, for, for kind of borders and naturalization of the, of the na national container is like scabbing, I love that. So um, let's, talk, let's talk about that because it's, it's a difficult issue and, and it's also something that's, that's come up almost immediately in response to the book from from areas of the left. So let's like let's talk about that. I don't know, Dali, you wanna um, come in on this? Yeah, um, I think that uh, the, um, so, and I said it before, I said, you know, I, I don't think you can really, you can message your way out of it. And I think that, you know, some of our comrades need to understand that not everything is comms, um, but, Subcoms is good, but not everything is comms. It's not the be all and end all. <laughs> but um, but having clarifying the story does help us just help clarify understanding, which is then important because then that informs um, action. And I think that um, one way of doing that is by making it clear that the systems of border control, and this is why I think scabbing is the phrase that I is the phrase actually describes what's happening here because when you scab what you essentially do is you are you know betraying your own workforce your workforce in a sense and you're kind of like you're hindering the fight for your own worker like your 
for the for the rights that you will then enjoy as a worker and I think this idea of like making it clear that racism is that capitalism sharpens its tools on the bodies of those who are dispossessed who are situated outside of these different categories that give you grant you access to whether it's the spoils of empire or you know citizenship or human humanity itself and I think that making it clear that the only way that we can blunt those tools and blunt the sharpening of those tools is through that acting of solidarity. And I think that this whole idea for, and you know, one thing we saw a lot over the past five years of like, okay, well, let's enter into this like weird bargain where like, we'll give you a little bit of racism in exchange for an NHS. But then to cut through that, and this is what, you know, Govinda's work does and also what your book does, which is realizing that racism is a key technique through which the NHS itself is being undermined. Um, whether it's through the progressive shrinking of who can get access to the NHS, who the NHS exists for, or whether it's through the exploitation and the brutalization of a racialized uh, workforce that leaves the people who actually run the NHS, um, you know, the nurses, the administrators, the cleaners, the doctors, uh, overstre overstretched, underpaid and traumatized. And so I think that that, that kind of creation of being collectively staked in this project is, is incredibly important. And I think that the kind of, this is where as well, I think we can um, borrow from uh, the abolition movement, which is this idea of not only entering into a sort of like defense of what once was, because I think because so much of our politics has been marked by anti-austerity, and you know, marked by the trying to protect our resources against, you know, attack from the neoliberal state, that we've almost um, forgotten how to dream of something different. You know, we're kind of so focused on trying to protect for, for very good reason, obviously, that I think that borrowing from that from the abolition movement of trying to imagine something that has not that is that can has not come it cannot come into being in our current conditions um is is something that is that is really important but i think that i think that yeah that that sense of of us being collectively staked and understanding that fighting the struggle at points when it affects people who might not look like us who or who might not we are told have anything in common with us is actually how we collectively have our collective bargaining power against the state and capital and um, which will always make its way around the workforce. No one is safe from it. Thanks. Does anyone else want to? I mean, this. I mean, this connects up, I guess, with jazz. What you were talking about in in terms of looking at um, connecting abolitional struggles around the police, like defunding of the police, to much broader struggles around exploitation um, and counterterrorism. Yeah, and I think um, just to sort of um, speak back to the question about sort of building alliances, um, in terms of building alliances between, um, you know, white working class groups and black and Asian working class groups, I think for me, the obvious kind of starting point with that, with that is the class position. Um, and I think um, expanding our understanding of what actually violence is, it's not just overt forms of you know using taser police using tasers on black bodies or um or you know police using firearms or stuff like that but actually um exploitation itself is, is a violence um it denies sort of basic things like you know people don't have the money to buy food or they don't have the money to buy basic sort of health um uh, sanitary sort of uh, uh, um, stuff and, and and everything else so i think um kind of exploitation is I think could be a starting point in that unit, you know, in, in, in building some sort of unified um, uh, struggle and, um, and yeah, and expanding kind of our understanding of the way in which the different modes of violence work. It's not just policing that's violent, even policing isn't really understood as, as violence. It's seen as this sort of, um, generally sort of seen as a, um, you know, something that's unassociated with violence. So I think we need to kind of expand that. And um, 
and yeah, and the other thing is in terms of exploitation would, would be a common thread, but I think actually history as well is a common thread. So just as colonized communities were being exploited abroad, you know, what working class communities within Britain itself in the, in the Victorian times were classified as the dangerous classes and were, um, you know, one of the ways in which the police was formed in 1829 was when Robert Peel um, argued that white working class people are inherently violent, inherently disorderly. These were colonial logics operating on mainland Brit Britain. So I think as much as exploitation in the contemporary moment is a, is a common thread and the violence of exploitation is a common thread, I think there's a history as well um, that ties different working class communities together. So I think those are kind of two starting points. And that's not to say that the exploitation is the same, operates differently according to different sort of communities and contexts, and you can't flatten that out. But I think those two things in terms of history and, and kind of violence, for me, would be starting points in terms of building some sort of solidarity. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think like I was chatting to Sahima about this last week and both, you know, she's she's currently writing um, about this stuff. And we were just saying how like, it is difficult not to get pessimistic. <laughs> Um, and certainly, you know, when, when you, I think when you're looking at, um, well, you've got to bear in mind as well, like I was finishing this book of just after um, Corbin, Corbin's defeat and like trudging around in the rain, um, knocking on people's <laughs> doors um, and that like seemingly disastrous um, defeat. So there's some, there's some, there was definitely some like pessimism in there. Um, I guess like, one of, I mean, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to go on about this. I think it's important in, to my mind, to, to absolutely like create those connections, but also to see the spaces in which um, these things should be differentiated. So we get the story right. Like, I think it's important to move away from the idea that the accumulation of capital has, has led to like the smoothing out of exploitation so that everybody universally becomes, uh, is put in the position of the worker. Um, and, and I think that, yeah, and that also kind of ties into what I'm talking about in that chapter that Dahlia mentioned around extinction um, politics. So like drawing on, on a lot of the work of people like Angela Metropolis um, amongst others, um, where, yeah, like rather than, rather than seeing where we are as this kind of flattening out where neoliberal near, near kind of welfare was, was removed and now everyone is in this kind of free fall. Um, race to the bottom or something. Um, we're increasingly seeing a, a world that's like carved up even more, like high, even, even more differentiations, even more kind of cross-border operations. Um, and, and like, and, and how those things are kind of, you know, you know, interestingly like geographically instantiated in ways that don't necessarily map onto kind of concrete material geography. So like, that you know the ways in which we kind of move through spaces are, are really highly differentiated so there's things like you know if you're on the gang matrix in Harringay, then you can have your driving license taken away from you but you could be living within like a few feet of someone who, who's owning a house for like a million quid right these like very proximate spaces in which in which there's a, this kind of like abstract forms of, of um segregation and things like that so I think it's important to 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 to, to also make those to make those differentiations, um, but also like I mean, this speaks to to kind of an understanding of what we understand by like anti exploitation, right, and anti capitalism as well, right. A lot of that is is being grounded in 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 the idea of um, material interests, right. And it is the case that for a lot of um, white people in this country, it's in their material interest to continue with the. Um, with the, the accumulated wealth of empire and the distribution of, of that um, to some degree across the, across the country has meant that we're in a better position um, than most people globally, um, even, the, even the poor in this country. And this is something we have to contend with. I think, I think like this, is, this is part of what I'm, what I'm trying to get to in the, in the last chapter where I'm actually drawing on one of Sahema's poems. Which is, which is to contend with like two things like one is like this this project is not possibly completable right because we we depend upon this this 
um, kind of drive almost to, to annihilate the world in order that we survive. But this is completely paradoxical. Um, what it can do is like ramp up and become fraught and flailing. And I feel like this is what we're seeing with um, a lot of the kind of decision-making uh, across the state and that kind of thing uh, at the moment. Um, Adam, I think you're gonna come in. And I, I, yeah, I thought it was really interesting what you were saying about, of course, this idea of differentiation, right? Which kind of uh, begins from the roots of, of capitalism or what we might call racial capitalism, right? But um, to go back, um, if you don't mind, to, to something positive again and thinking about resistance, um, what um, uh, Dali and Jansen were both saying made me think about this false um, division between, on the one hand, uh, the kind of protests that we've seen uh, over the summer of 2020, where there have been these focus, this fo and the kind of politics we associate with anti-racism, which often focuses on prisons and police and borders and the ways in which they reproduce these forms of racial violence. And then on the other hand, uh, the kind of anti-austerity politics we associate with the Corbyn projects that considered um, uh, uh, racialized voters to be uh, disposable effectively, because, um, you know, so therefore we can, um, we don't need to think about prisons and police and borders. And one of the things that abolitionists, I think, has enabled um, a lot of activists to have the language to articulate is the fact that these two things are actually intimately connected. Right? And so the language of, one, of, of defunding the police and prison and police abolition is about saying, right, let the reason that the prison population has almost doubled in the last, since the early 90s, is not disconnected from the fact that we have we have, we have had we have seen an erosion in the kinds of community services, social services, um, housing provision, um, education, etc. All of these type, all of these, all of these um, forms of social and community infrastructure that we need in order to live um, meaningful lives. And so, rather than there being some kind of like pay up some kind of um, a competition between do we like battle the state violence law and all this stuff or do we battle the cuts against welfare and the cuts against um, uh, job creation and housing and those types of things I think one of the things that the uh, politics of abolition um, are doing are saying that those two things are intimately connected and when people take to the streets um, saying that we want to end prison violence, we want to end uh, policing, we want to end the border regime. We're also saying we, we, what we need to do is replace those things. And what we replace those things with aren't, the things that are, aren't simply the things that austerity um, has taken away from us, but, are, but is, a, is, a, is a reimagining of those kinds of forms of care and community and, and sociality that can make our lives more enriched and, more, and, and, and safer and less harm, harm filled. And so I think drawing those kinds of connections through these kinds of abolitionist arguments, I think is really, really important and, and, and um, quite hopeful in a lot of ways. And I think lastly, the thing, other thing it makes me think about is the urgency for the left to have a greater political imagination, not simply by making those connections between um, uh, uh, Britain, um, between abolition and um, uh, the end of austerity, but also by arguing for the fact that, yes, uh, a lot of poor white people in Britain may benefit from imperialism, but they would benefit far more by the dismantling of capitalism. Right? And that's the political imagination that we need to have, right? Yeah, it's great being like a peasant in the sense of empire, but you know, it's even better than that, socialism. Um, <laughs> and and it's, about, and it's about enabling people to have, to have those kinds of, I guess, radical dreams and visions um, that I think are, is, is so important um, through those different kinds of uh, connections and, and, international so and international as well as local solidarities. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. That's, that's that, that, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat. I wonder if we can, I mean, Sahima, just because you haven't spoken for a minute, do you want to answer one of these? Maybe the... Um... I can't answer these questions. <laughs> these are not directed at me, I can tell you that right now. <laughs> I, can, I mean, maybe I'll bring, let me bring you in with a question then, then we'll get to these ones then, maybe. Um, I was gonna, can I just respond to stuff, something that Adam was saying that I just thought was interesting? Um, was like, yeah, it was just making me think about um, what you, the connection you're making about austerity and how we can never think about two things at the same time, e.g. race, but also what you were saying about political imagination. I think somewhere where I see all these, these things sort of merge is that um, 
a, a phenomenon that I've been noticing over the last few years. I mean, I've recently moved back to Leeds and anything here, so youth clubs, community centre, um, football club, you know, literally everything is funded in some way by a home office stream, which is linked to counter extremism, right? So, and that's purely because of the demographics of the area, right? So it's, it, everything is funded through that. And the only reason, so when you bring this up with these, when you say, look, this is problematic, like this is, this is not great. Um, the kind of response is what, well, you know, it's so hard to get funding these days. Like we, we just kind of have to settle with it. And so I think at the same time as the government, you know, takes away, you know, social funding, there's the only option becomes this funding with strings attached, which is surveillance and policing. So you, you have to adhere to that. But what that does then is that, you know, what does it mean for a social worker who's working with young people in their youth club that's funded by counter extremism, which says that opposition to British values is extremism. Now that young person comes in and they're talking about, oh, you know, the gov you know, the reason that I'm poor is because of the government, the reason that, you know, X, Y, Z is that they're, do they count as being, you know, extremists now? Is that what happens? And the result of that to me is that when, it's not only that, you know, we're lacking political imagination in those, those ways you mentioned, which are actually really exciting, but it's that also that I think it's this, subtle but very deliberate coercion of the limits of our imaginings right we're not allowed to imagine beyond this version of democracy even that um report i was just reading the quote from earlier hateful extremism it's like this, this these two discourses right because the hateful extremism report says um it, hate is a, is a threat to democracy but then even some critics of the report would be like oh the, you know this kind of um, encroachment of freedoms is a threat to democracy and in both cases democracy is sort of the, the highest form of the nation that we can imagine and it's always within the horizon of the nation right and it's always within empire and border and all of that and so yeah i just think that when when we're for, we're kind of forced right into this corner where the only debate we can have is on the terms of the state in the first place so the extent of the opposition that you can really imagine as a young person or just you know thinking again about where I'm living, it's like the extent of what you can imagine is really just, um, you know, let me prove I'm not a terrorist. That's it, like, that's it. There's no political, forget about political imagination. And so not to be a pessimist, but, but I think that, that, you know, to kind of bring that around to my, my answer to some of the questions from earlier is that, you know, books like this, we need to be turning them into political education that is really accessible as well. I think that's something that's really crucial in what I see is that these conversations, need to kind of, you know, move down out of ac academic spaces as well and be really, you know, in those youth clubs, right? Be in those spaces where people are just not able to kind of make those links because they're not being made. Um, and I think that's what's exciting about this and these kinds of conversations and obviously the work that um, most of you guys are doing as well. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think, um, yeah, like you say, this, I mean, this also, we were chatting before when we like this, the move, the suggested move around like knife crime is also to to, to fund um, youth and community groups um, specifically on the basis that they will both identify, give data to, and um, like fight against um, knife crime and stuff like that. And there's this this idea that there'll be a le another like a similar kind of prevent style um, legal duty to report um, people who who are like I don't know likely to be involved in knife crime and like you know who those people are going to be. It's not. You know, this isn't too difficult um, to imagine. Um, so yeah, I guess this is interesting. Like, if you if you think about, I mean, if you think about counterinsurgency um, in this way, and is this, um, like, I mean, this connects up to what you were talking about in terms of history as well. Like, this is this is the concerted effort on on the part of um, the like British state or white supremacy across the British state. To, to engage in, in propaganda. Um, but propaganda in, in like, not in this kind of top-down like standard way that we often think about, but like hegemony, you know, um, like bottom up kind of like, how do you, how do you kind of feed people, feed people's common sense? How do you create the conditions under which, um, you know, norms and, and, and communal ideas arise? Um, so, some kind of yeah the programs of political education that we need to combat that are huge um and i think i mean partly this is also partly like what you're pointing to sahema is that is that the complicity in those projects that inevitably some people have to take part in i mean i'm complicit in bordering i'm i'm, I'm giving um tier four checks to the home office um, 
we talk, I mean, talk about that quite a bit, like we're conscripted into this. We have to deal with that, um, that issue as, as, part, as part of the way in which we then formulate how, how we might kind of work, um, work to undermine it. I think we've talked, I'm just looking at this question, like we talked quite a bit about um, sort of left politics and the, this idea of, I mean, you can tell from the book that I'm like slightly less positive about the idea of state politics. Um, but let's let's let me like dig into this thing about like I like this idea of collectively unsettling people's expectations of property um, as a site of security and delinking the home the site of, of the home from property. Um, I mean, rather than me talking, maybe I don't know, Adam, you were um, quite interested in this. Do you wanna? Do you got any any ideas? So you, you cut out there. Can you repeat that? Sorry, just cut out. So this is this question from um, Gabrielle in the chat that I'm looking at um, about property and the home. I mean, the way that, like in in Britain, the home as a as a as a place for the accumulation of wealth, um, and therefore as a position of security, has been really like incredibly entrenched across um, working and middle classes. How do we unsettle yeah. that? It's a massive question. I don't know if I have the answer to that question. Um, um, hmm. I think one of the ways in which we can probably do it is by thinking about some of the already existing kind of uh, organizations and movements which are trying to defend forms of collective ownership. So a lot of the kind of campaigns, for instance, in relation to housing, um, uh, for, some of, for the, some of the council estates being demolished, aren't people being like, we want to leave, leave the, these council estates and we want like, you know, the perfect white picket fence and, and uh, semi-detached. People are saying we want this to stay in this estate. We actually really like this communal living. We like having these communal states, spaces. I love my neighbours um, and it's a really brilliant place to live and we want to live like that. Um, and you can say similar things about uh, the youth clubs that are being, um, that are being, people are defending and the other kinds of community spaces that are being that are being defended. And people are saying, we don't want to have like a private nightclub move in here that's all trendy and expensive. We want to have our community space. We don't want a private gym to move uh, to move in here. We want to have our youth center. So there are all of these ways in which pe people are trying to defend um, uh, uh, these forms, these, these co common spaces, right? These, these collective uh, places and spaces um, in ways that I think help to push back against this tide of um, uh, this kind of hegemonic tide, which says the best things are the privatized things. Um, and all you need to do is work hard and aspire to get to that expensive gym or into that expensive nightclub or all of that other, or, or, you know, or buy a ticket at the White Hart Lane Stadium, which just taken over half of Tottenham. Like right? you just need to work hard and to get into all of those places. And I think there is a, there is a lot of, there are a lot of people um, who are being affected by these kinds of changes, which are, who are saying no. Um, and I think that's something that's, um, mm. I think, bolstering and supporting those kinds of initiatives might be one way about it. Um, but it's a, it's a difficult and, yeah, it's a very good question. Yeah. Does, any, does anyone else want to come in on this? I think, I mean, obviously, the, yeah, there's quite a bit in, in the book where I'm talking about um, the way that we understand property through um, colonial logics and, and like, I mean, yeah, like Adam was talking about how this, how this relates to areas that are left for, um, that are like through managed decline that are then picked up through, through what we call gentrification, um, but which is, yeah, linked to, to this like ideas of development and things like that. I guess the other thing would be thinking about how, how we understand security as well. And the way in which, you know, security isn't just isn't just a personal thing security has to be a collective thing that my security depends on my neighbor's security and the rest of my community's security and everything else and that you know security is only sort of um viable if everyone has access to you know basic rights like housing education and so on and so forth if people don't have those things then you know that's 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 a kind of a uh, those are conditions for insecurity and the other thing is kind of flipping the idea of security in terms of national security as well. So, you know, it's not about seeing people from other places as a threat, 
but actually seeing them as people who um, are, you know, un uh, subject to violence and exploitation and so on, which is of the nation, Britain's own, you know, Britain's complicit in that. So I think, um, yeah, expanding our concept of security and not, not sort of grounding it in militarized terms like national security and defense of the border um, and so on and so forth, but seeing it in a different way, um, something that's more sort of communal, something that's more ba rooted in basic human rights, access to certain things and, 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 and kind of going down that path. Again, I don't know the sort of the intricacies of that, but that might be some sort of starting point, I think. Yeah, so like security is kind of a collective ability and a, a gathering rather than a, um, an exclusion. And, like, and there's clearly there's the case when you think about the accumulation of wealth in housing and um, the like forces of development. Um, like if you if you own you know if you own property in those areas, then you're in a position to stave off that change at least for you. Um, I, I mean, absolutely, Jazz. Like thinking about this much more collectively is 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 clearly the the kind of the key it has to be. And this is, I guess, part of that. Um, part of what that does, perhaps, is that that like accumulation of wealth in the home is to create the conditions under which you will. At least it seems like your material securities are linked to um, your own ability to, to kind of like home yourselves and, and your families and children and that but like very much ties into the kind of relationships between nuclear family and nation and this and this kind of thing. Um, let me so there's a question in, in the chat that I don't really want to answer, <laughs> which is about devolution, basically. Um, does, does someone else want to want to pick that up? This is so tricky. This is so tricky. Um, um, I think uh, so. With that question, I mean, it's it's not an area that I am in any way qualified to speak about. What I would say is, I think that um, a lot of the 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 um, I think some of the friendly nationalism that underpins some of the thinking around that of the idea of like, oh, Scottish nationalism is different because it's nice to black people is a bit, I'm sure Scottish black people in Scotland would be like, mm. um, but, and, you know, I think that that is not the premise on which I, you know, I wouldn't, I think that that's a delusion. That doesn't mean that I don't think that's you know, independence should happen or that there should be a vote or whatever. I think that that, that particular framework um, is a delusion. You don't come through um, the, nation, the, nation, the national unit. And I also think this idea, firstly, also that like so much of the colonial, so many of the colonial practices in the UK take place like very much within London. And like that will continue, you know, the presence of the stock exchange and then, you know, insurers of, all of these sort of colonial projects will remain in that. And I think that this idea of like, oh, but if Scottish, Scotland is really progressive, then like England might then feel like it can be more progressive. I'm just like, I just, that's just not how it works. I think that the, I think that that question by Gabriel was actually like such a good question. The one about the pro property and security. And I think that like, um, there's, it, it's, it's like, so firstly, I think that 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 what Jazz said about delinking this idea of security from, you know, uh, policing and from this idea of, you know, and this is one thing that Paul Mason really likes. He really likes this idea of like, we need to talk about personal security more, i.e. we need to talk about like, um, that's the framework through which we like have, um, we, that's why we need to talk about policing and stuff like that. That's what matters on the doorstep and all of that. I think that one thing that is, one step that we can take in order to get towards that more collective idea of what it means to be safe and not on the brink of expulsion. Because to me, that's what people want when they want security. And I often find that, you know, I've been working with um, Uber drivers and thinking about uh, and talking to them about like um, this, Uber drivers are very heavily policed because it's a racialized workforce. And there's this whole thing about how like Uber drivers are always seen as a threat. They're scary. They are, are sexually deviant. They are, you know, da, da, da. 
and they often want to talk about the, the fact that they are often the subject of a lot of the violence. Mini cab driving, taxi driving is an incredibly unsafe job. Um, and often that leads to like, oh, I what the demand is there for, for police to take me seriously, for me to be able to call the police and for the police to come. And when, when we talk about that, and I find that oftentimes I, we can cut through that by me saying, what do you want from the, like, what is it that you want from the police? What, what is it that you want from, uh, you know, conviction, the conviction or like, you know, the person that has, har that has harmed you from being arrested? And when you get down to it, it's, it's recognition, recognition that harm has taken place against me. And it's, healing which is needed for you know he recognition is needed for healing and it's also a sense of I want to feel like that's not going to happen to me because someone is disincentivized from doing that to me because they will be you know that there is some kind of disincentivization for them to do that to me right and so when we think about security I think thinking about what is it when people say that they want to feel secure and they want national security they want personal security what they're saying is I don't want to constantly feel like I'm on the brink of expulsion which is how I feel and I think the pandemic was such an interesting is such an I'm saying this like it's not still happening is such an interesting thing because at the time when food was not on the shelves um, no one knew what was coming. The government wasn't putting in the measures that we needed to stay safe. People could still be forced to go into work. The presence of those mutual aid groups, the presence of trade unions who were able to like fight for workers to not have to go in in unsafe conditions. Those are examples of way of not being on that brink of expulsion, but through mechanisms of mutual care and being together. And that being together, being close to your neighbor, being close to the people around you was not a threat. You know, you don't have to nestle into your home and be far away from things. It became the way that people were able to feel that kind of safety and that kind of protection and that feeling that they are being held. And so I think sometimes trying to get like try to get to that essence of what it is there are people are asking for, you often find that it's not that far from the vision that we're trying to carve out. Adam, you're looking like you're wanting to say something. No. No, 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 just adjusting myself in my seat. <laughs> um, I'm getting told by Will that we should be really wrapping up because we're like quarter of an hour over, um, which is, I mean, which is fine. Like, I wish we could chat for longer. But, um, at some point when the pandemic is over, um, we should, we should, uh, yeah, maybe we can do something more like, in the in the in the real world again and have a drink and chat over that that'd be great i really appreciate everything um that you've been saying this evening and for and for um all of the words and for just reading the book as well um is i really appreciate that a great deal i've written some notes i'm going to return to those um so thanks very much to to jazz and to adam and to suhema and to dahlia and again to, to uh, autonomy and pluto and thanks for all of you for, for joining us. Um, it's, it's, it's been great to, to see you all here. Um, and again, if you do wanna get the book from Pluto, then there is, oh, thanks, Jack. <laughs> Jack is better on, on the plugging of the book than, than I am. <laughs> um, but that's great. And yeah, I hope, hope to see you all um, at, at some other event after pan pandemics, preferably, and then, and then real life. Um, okay. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, James. Sure.